Have you ever wondered about the beast of revelations? Many of us are greatly concerned about the physical mark of the beast as we see the development of technology, we hear of chips and implants, and there is good reason to be concerned about that. But there is more, because the Bible has got a prophetic meaning on the spiritual level as well. Revelations 13 has a spiritual meaning that runs all the way through. you got to hear this. And if you think about the descriptions of this beast, it all has prophecy. The whole prophecy actually starts with John that's standing by the side of the sea. John it has a prophecy in his name, thus the grace of God. And when something stands, it means it's established. The grace of God is established. So that is the one option. The only option of entering into heaven, according to the scripture, is through the death of Jesus. Grace is there. How awesome is that? You can go to heaven. Jesus has died instead of you. It is a gift from God to you. If you receive and you want it, you serve God. The grace of God stands. It is there. But then he says, oh, here comes something else. Here comes something that wants to remove your life from you. Here comes something that wants to pull you away from Jesus. Here comes something as a type of alternative. But the thing is not in the image of grace. The thing is in the image of a beast. The language that this prophecy is given us, a beast ties with a hunting trap, something that wants to destroy and entrap you. It is a trap that is coming up in end time. There is a wild, ferocious trap on the hunt. We find that John stands by the sand of the sea. That's a prophecy. John stands by the sand of the sea. In other words, John means God's grace. When something stands, it is established. God's grace is established. Jesus has died and risen. And it is by the sand. What is the sand? But an innumerable multitude of the crushing of the rock. By the sea. What do you hear? But a great roar. In Hebrew, the word roar has a tie with sea. And we find that Jesus is the lion who has died. The lion of Judah that roared. It is finished. He took the death verdict. Therefore, the grace of God is established by the great roar. The sea is also an incredibly vast body of water. Water in Hebrew ties with wasting. Thus, by his wasting, by his great roar, there by that innumerable multitude, the sand of the great roar and the wasting of the death of Jesus stands God's grace, John. But despite that, despite that Jesus has died, despite that everything has been done, all that incredible terror that he went through is established. Here comes this alternative, this trap. This hunting trap that is after people, and they buy into it. So, what does this trap look like? How does it operate? The Bible tells us. It is in all the strange sounding descriptions that John gives us. Remember, God's grace is telling you what you should be careful for. John means God's grace. So he sees this thing. He writes this message to you. God's grace is warning you against the trap. The first description that he speaks regarding this trap is that it has a lot of heads, a lot of horns. So let's consider that. Heads in Greek, the language that this has given us in the Bible. Head ties, it is something, if you think of the earthly, your head is something that you grasp with, you understand, you grasp with. This thing has a great grasp if you think about the number of heads, there are seven. Seven ties with full. So it has a full grasp. It has a tremendous grasp, a tremendous grip on people. This trap has got a full grip. The beast has got seven heads. And if you understand what this trap is and you see how people respond to that when they're not rooted in Jesus, it does have a great appeal to people. It lures them in. It has a grip on them. Therefore, you must be so wary of this thing because it grips people. It sounds nice to them. They are drawn and attracted to it. It has a full grasp. 
seven heads. And we know that something has happened to those heads, and that's prophecy as well. We can speak about that just now. But let's go to the next description that John gives in that first verse. We find that on its heads, in other words, on its grasp, that grip that it has on people, it has ten horns with ten crowns. All right, and crown you already have the kingly association. Ten in Hebrew ties with accumulation. Right, adding up horns. Right, again, the animal imagery is helping us. If you think about a horn, what does a horn do? Why do, does animals have horns? But to attack and defend itself. If you think about attack and defend in the spiritual, yes, the physical, it, it has a war image. But in the spiritual, if you think about argumentative language, it is a deception that is coming up and it is incredibly equipped to attack and defend its reasoning. It is a doctrine that sounds so logical, that sounds so good to people. It has, remember, seven heads, a full grasp on people. The only thing that prevents you from its lure, its grasp, is loving God and following what he has said in the Bible. That Jesus is the only way and you can serve no other God. You're going to hear it later on. It's in the descriptions of this beast and what it stands for. On its heads, in other words, on its grasp, that grip that it has on people, it has ten horns with ten crowns. Right? And crown you already have the kingly association. Crown also ties with a bond or a binding. If you think about a crown, it is something that goes like a binding around the head. This thing comes with a binding. The thing comes with dominion that is accumulating. This trap has the nature of blasphemy. Because we find on its heads is the name of blasphemy. Name in Hebrew ties with character, renown, report what you're known for. This thing is known for blasphemy. It is blaspheming the name of God. The two names of God, the first two names given in the Bible, let's just quickly talk about that. Remember, this beast has the character of blasphemy. The names of God in Eli and Yahweh, the two abbreviated forms of the name of God in Genesis 1 and 2, as it's given. In God's names is prophesied how he saves. It says God has got the might to turn things around. And remember the Eli, God turned the darkness to light. And in Yahweh we find God is the breather out of his breath to give life. Thus the one that breathes out his breath to give life turns the darkness. It's a prophecy that was fulfilled. Jesus breathed out his breath and the darkness was turned and there was light. In other words, there is life because he died. God's grace is established. But this thing blasphemes that. Who is God? He's the one that has the might to turn the darkness. In other words, he can turn the death verdict away from us. He is the one that breathes out his breath to give life. This thing blasphemes. God, he is the one that gives us grace. But this thing teaches it is not God, but man that can do that. There is much given us in verse 2 where we find that the beast is likened to something. Because here God is giving us a description of what we should be on the lookout for. This thing is like a leopard. In other words, the trap, the beast that wants to hunt people, that wants to lure people, that has got such a grip on people, you're going to hear why they like it so much. It's because of this leopard and bare feet. The leopard. Leopard in Greek, the language that it is given, is actually in the Greek compound description. Right in Pardalai, it ties with pardos and lion. And in the pardos, it goes to a panther, which is also associated with a snake. So we are having a compound beast that ties with snake and lion, right? mixed broth. We also find in that panther, the first section of that word pan means all. In pantheos you find all gods. It is a mixed broth. A panther, all gods, pan, ideology. The lion. Jesus is the lion of Judah that gives us redemption. And here a mixed broth is offered as an alternative, supposedly doing the same. This beast is a doctrine of redemption that is rooted on bare feet. What is your feet? Your feet is what you stand on. Your feet is what you move with. 
So now we're going to hear what this whole thing is based on and how it operates, how it moves. It is moving with the feet of a bear. Arco bear in Greek. Eyes with a root archeo, which means to be sufficient, to be enough, being self-sufficient. Thus this thing is rooted on self-sufficiency. This thing is rooted and moves by the principle of being sufficient and enough and strong enough to ward off. Thus we have a mixed process of religion that is rooted on the principle of self-sufficiency. Jesus said that he is the only way. His testimony brings the grace of God, which is established as we read in the first verse, John stands. God's grace is there in Jesus. But there is this trap that comes up that has a terrible grip on people. It has a full grasp. It's very strong. It's very alluring to people. They like it. This thing that lures them in, this thing that's so good at attacking and defending there with its ten horns, in other words, this vast accumulative power to attack and defend like an animal would with those horns, this thing that's so good at its arguments that wants to attack, come against and oppose what John stands for, God's grace is rooted in Jesus. This thing that is so clever and so luring to people that has got such a grip and pull on them, now you know why. Because it says everything. It's very inclusive. And it says that it is established. It moves on self-sufficiency. Now to understand that, just think about this. The doctrine that teaches that all ways are but the same, doesn't matter whatever you believe, even atheism, even works, whatever you believe, it boils down to what? Bare feet. It boils down to self-sufficiency. It says that man is sufficient. In man can ward off the death verdict. Man can do it himself. He's such a good person. He should go to heaven. What? Because he's self-sufficient. Can you see the doctrine? It stands on that. It moves on that. So then, because man is so self-sufficient according to this doctrine, it doesn't matter whatever he believes. He can pick and choose. It's all but the same. It nullifies what Jesus has done because why, why did he have to do that if man is so self-sufficient? has got such bare feet. It belittles God. It's got the character of blasphemy. But yet people love it. Why? Because it sounds so humane. It sounds so fair. It sounds so kind. It sounds like a wonderful doctrine. Can you see? It's got a full grasp. Seven heads. Bare feet. The descriptions that God gave is truly perfect. This thing has the mouth of the lion. In other words, it has the teaching, the doctrine of whitening. It has the doctrine of redemption. It comes like an alternative to Jesus, that is the Lion of Judah that has died, that has roared, that has breathed out his breath to give us whitening. But this thing says, ah, oh, oh, there's another way. I can't even say that because it's not true. And we find that this thing with a mouth like the lion is empowered by deception of Satan. Because remember Satan in the very beginning, what was one of his prime lies there back in Eden to the first woman before she fell into sin? Is, you shall not surely die, or you will be like God. What does this thing teach? That you can be like Jesus? He died, he rose. Now you think you can do it yourself? You can turn the darkness like God? Be like oh God. Be self-sufficient? And think that your works is sufficient. Why? Because the punishment for sin is according to Satan, not death. Think about this. If you truly believe that the punishment for sin is death, and you want to uphold your works as a sufficient means of redemption before God, being a sinner, all of us are guilty before God. If you go to stand before the judge one day, Satan, the accuser comes and says, you're guilty of sin, you, you should go to Punishment for sin is death, you, you to go to hell. If you offer your works instead of that, who's taken the verdict? It would be the equivalent of standing in front of a judge, being guilty of a death verdict and offering him cookies that you bake and think that that would suffice. It cannot, it, it will not take away that verdict. It can't take the verdict. God doesn't lie. Satan lied. The punishment for sin stands. It is death. If you believe in works, if you believe in any other way but Jesus who has died in the stead of you, it means that you don't believe the punishment for sin is death. So we find that this thing that rests on self-sufficiency 
is empowered by Satan, who told people the punishment for sin is not death, and that they can be like God. In other words, self-redeem. They can be a type of Messiah for themselves, and they can one day enter into heaven on their own name. No, we are there because of God, because of God's grace. John's name means God's grace. It is by grace that we go into heaven. Grace that is established, not us, not our names, not the bare feet, not the self-sufficiency, not the ideology that we're so good, we're so wonderful, that is empowered by the idea that the punishment for sin is not death and that we can be like a type of a God, Messiah character there and get ourselves into heaven because we're so good. And you see, but people like it. It is a deceptive thing if they don't love the grace of God, if they don't love what Jesus has done. Satan is also given its throne. So this thing ends up becoming the dominant narrative. And it gives its authority to this doctrine, to this beast, to this deception that wants to hunt and trap people. Authority in the Greek ties with liberty, with freedom, with privilege, with competency. So what can you expect? This trap is going to be dominant. If you switch on the TV, the radio, the internet, wherever you turn your head, walk in the street, you're going to hear trap talk. Because it has been given fast liberties. Then we find, here we again see the mercy of God. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And what is translated here as one? You find in the one there's a type with the first, with the prime, primary, unity. Alright, so... Remember the head ties with the grasp. The prime grasp of this thing was wounded to death. The prime grasp of the trap was destroyed. If you think about a dragon like a type of monster that's being slayed, usually if you think about a dragon slayer, you think about the sword that comes and somebody chops off the head of the dragon so that he can't kill you. The grip of this thing was slayed by the word of God so that he can't grasp you. This thing was rendered powerless for its ability to lure you. If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus, God decapitated that thing's grip on you. This beast can have no grip on you as a Christian who knows God. Why? Because his sword has chopped off the grip of the thing. Remember God's word said, you can serve no other but him in his commandments. Jesus said, he is the only way. In other words, Jesus' name means God's salvation. God's salvation that came through the death of Jesus is the only way. It is the only way to the Father. If you know that, this thing that teaches always, lion, panther, ideology that rests on self-sufficiency, is completely against what God says. His word chopped off that thing's grip. If you believe the word of God, you cannot believe the beast. How incredibly wonderful is God? But now, what did the people do? We find that the deadly wound was healed. That word that is translated as healed in the Greek ties with therapy. If you think of therapy, people nurse and nurse and work and pay much attention and do therapies there to revive and bring back to life. So what's going on with this trap? This trap that God's word decapitated, rendered powerless to have any grasp on you. But there was made a lot of trouble, a lot of therapy was done to find a way around what God's word has forbidden, to find loopholes and corners and clever reasonings to bring back the grasp, to restore the grip of the thing, so that people can look at this ideology as an alternative to Jesus being the only way and think that it is pleasing to God and found a way around God's word to convince people that this thing is permissible and then the world goes after the trap they love it they like to find this restoration of this ideology that's actually forbidden by God everybody but those that love the Word of God runs after the thing they like it they admire it they marvel it they they prefer it they end up saying who is like unto the beast in other words what can come close to this thing what can come close to this Ideology of everything gives you whitening. What can be so kind, so wonderful, so fierce, so humane, so 
whatever has the strap. The only problem is, it's blasphemy. It belittles what Jesus has done. It renders it totally unnecessary. It, it makes man to the equal of Jesus. It belittles the, the names of God. It goes straight against what his word says when he decapitated this whole thing's group. So, no love for God in this thing. No love for Jesus. But yet the people love this. They say, who is like this? In other words, what can come close to this thing? Who is able to make war with it? Now war, we tend to think of that only in terms of the physical, but in the spiritual it has a tie with strife and dispute as well. In other words, they say, who can argue against it? They love it so much, they think it is so humane, it is so morally superior to say that every, everything that mankind can come up with gives him redemption, you have him enter into heaven because they believe man is sufficient to ward off whatever obstacle considering their sin and they don't believe the punishment for sin is death. They love that so much, they say, who can argue against it? Because they think it's fair and moral when they are in the grip of this thing. Remember, this thing has a lure to people, it grips them. Then, when people are starting to say no one can reason against this because this is so supreme, we find that there was given to it a mouth that speaks great things. Next, we read that the blasphemous talk of this thing is going to carry on for a certain allocated time. This thing that has such a liberties and freedom, so predominant in the world, will continue and it boils down to blasphemy. Slanders and hinders what God has done in Jesus, our only way to salvation. Because it finds the idea, what I just said, that Jesus is the only way, which is the words, but he said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. In other words, the only way to life is Jesus. If you say that, it offends the trap. Because the trap wants plurality. The trap is boiled on the self-sufficiency of man. And that is offended by the idea that man can't save himself and needs the hope of God. It is offended by it. It wants to uplift itself. Remember, Satan promised you shall be like a god. Right? It gets very furious if you speak like that. It's got the name of blasphemy, the character. Name ties with character of blasphemy. The authority, the ability, the character of God as the one that gives life and turns around where there was death to give life. Turns to death to bring the life. What happened when Jesus was on the cross? The darkness was gone and the light came by his breath. He breathed out his breath three. That was... When the light came, remember? Darkness prior. Prophecy. Genesis 1 fulfilled. There was darkness. God brings the light. Not us. God. But this thing blasphemes the character of God. This thing blasphemes each tabernacle. Tabernacle ties with your tent, with your dwelling. If you think about the tabernacle, we find that in the Exodus journey, where the people was taken from the place of captivity, heading towards the promised land, God tabernacling amongst them and taking them there. Jesus came to dwell with us, tabernacled amongst us, taking us from the place of our captivity, the place where we couldn't get out. We are guilty of the death verdict. We are enslaved to it. But we could get out under the prophecy of the blood of the Lamb sign, which he fulfilled. He dwelled with us. He tabernacled with us, taking us to the promised land in the prophetic fulfillment, which is heaven. But this thing blasphemes the tabernacling of God, Jesus coming to dwell amongst us. This thing blasphemes them that are in heaven. We go to heaven because of the testimony of Jesus. It ends up making war. And we find in the root word for that, apart from the physical battle, we find a spiritual meaning that ties with disputing, strifing, quarreling. This thing comes to strife and quarrel and battle and argue against Christians. If you're a Christian in end time finding yourself in a battle, Somebody's coming to argue and strife against you, speaking this doctrine of this thing, this strife. It does seek you out to come and argue against you. And it has the power to subdue. Remember, it's very good at attack and defense. Christians are going to be suppressed by this thing. It has the power to overcome and prevail. It becomes the dominant narrative of the day. Christians become silenced persecuted, killed, they don't have a space or a platform to talk, it's all given because this thing has freedom, it has liberties, it has jurisdiction in the world, it has liberties that enters in the way of living of everybody across the world 
save. The set apart saints that disagree with this, the Christians that believe in grace of God that is rooted not in them but in God. They have a problem with this situation in end time that comes against them. But just stop here for a moment. Remember God loves those people. God chopped off that head, that grasp of that beast. God doesn't want them to be in that doctrine and he still loves them. We must not persecute them. We must not kill them. You must pray for them. God loves them. Hurt no one, but hold fast to the testimony of grace. Grace stands. That's the only way to your life. Have no part in this doctrine of deception of end time, but do not hurt any individual person that may be falling trapped to it. We find that the people of the world will worship this trap. They love it. In other words, they go down to admire and kiss it. They think it is so humane. And we find in Revelation 13 verse 8, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship, in other words, adore, kiss, go down before this thing. They just think it is awesome. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. It's going to think it is, it is the greatest solution to anything they've ever heard about. I find that their names, those that like that, their names is not written in the book, or right in the literal, their names literally, but also named as with character. In other words, their way of, of behaving, their way of trusting in such things, their character, their renown, what they're known for. Believing that man can save himself, you don't need God, you can choose whatever you want to and everything is but the same, all that type of doctrine, that does not belong in the book of life that cannot go there because it blasphemes it. It is in direct opposition. Now we have an instruction. If any man has an ear, let him hear. In other words, if you have any means of comprehending and listening, if you have any means of understanding, listen, understand. He that goes into captivity shall go into captivity. Remember, it is a trap that wants to entrap, that wants to take captive people. If you are going to this trap, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to be taken by it. Stay away from this doctrine. Not people or belittle them or hurt them, any, anything like that. But the ideology of the trap. Stay out of it. Don't entertain this in terms of your own mind. Because if you go to it, it's going to trap you. It's going to take you. It has got a full grasp on people. It's appealing. It has got strong abilities to reason. That can offense powerful horns there. If you can understand this, he that kills with the sword, the sword dies with the word. God's word gives redemption. But if you come and speak this thing that doesn't lead to redemption as a means of whitening this broth that rests on man's self-sufficiency, if anyone is killing with the sword, it is befitting that he be killed by the sword. If you subscribe to that ideology, it's going to take you captive. If you minister that ideology that brings death to people because it takes them away from salvation, you too will lose your life, your salvation because of that ideology. Don't minister it. Don't subscribe to it. It's going to destroy you. It is a trap, a ferocious, wild, powerful, deceptive trap that is an opposition to God's grace which is the only way. If you hold fast to the word of God, this thing has no power on you. Awesome is God to protect us so. How graceful is he. In his grace, he has given us this. Be forewarned. God loves people. Don't persecute them. But this trap does not love you. Stay away from it. Stay away from this entrapping doctrine this beast that has such a strong grip on people living in end time. It can take you captive. It can remove your life. Grace stands by Jesus' death in the stead of you. He alone can turn the darkness away from you. Hear God's gracious message to you. God loves you.